Hello, welcome to this episode of the DHF Podcast. We're a ministry of Disciple Heritage Fellowship, and you can find out more about us at discipleheritage.org. Today, I have with me, again, a co-host that you know, Chris. Say hi, Chris. Hey, everybody. I'm Chris Henderson. I'm the lead pastor of uh, Windsor Christian Church. I'm Sam, and I'm a DHF board member. So if you're new around here, you probably know I used to say that I was a pastor out in California, but now I'm actually being involved in the first from the ground up DHF church plant coming to Clarksville, Tennessee later this year. Uh, But today we're going to not talk about the things we've got going on (laughs) directly in our ministries, but we have a friend on that I've found online, been Facebook friends for a little bit, but was following his ministry uh, and really enjoyed a recent podcast I watched him on. And he's talking about a topic that we deal with very practically uh, in our churches, especially DHF churches. Many of us come from a different denomination that went and became very progressive. And so I'm going to introduce to you guys to David Walcott, who is an expert on progressive Christianity. David, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you began this pursuit in understanding mm-hmm. progressive Christianity? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'm a veteran apologist. Uh, I've been behind the scenes for most of my apologetics career, just working in Facebook groups. But over the last few years, uh, things uh, God has changed a lot of things. Uh, and I'm now um, actually getting on stage in terms of uh, actually teaching on some of the subjects I've been researching. Uh, so in particular, my first many years in apologetics was dealing predominantly with new atheists, i.e. followers of Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, and the like. Over the last couple of years, <clears throat> uh, it started when Elisa Childers' book came out in October of 2020. Uh, I had connected with her uh, around that time through the launch of the book and offered to do a little bit of reading for her since i read so much anyways, I was like, hey, I can pick up, you know, a progressive book or two and, you know, read it to help her with her research. So that was the end of 2020. And I got, I think, one or two books for her. And then over the last four years, it turned into uh, my own passion. And I now own about 150 book or 150 progressive Christian books. I've read over 50 of them. My goal, one of my reading goals for this year is to read another 50 of them. Um, and they are, uh, uh, Richard uh, Rohr, Brian McLaren, Pete N, Sarah Bessie, Rachel Held Evans. Uh, I've got Brian Zahn on the list for this year, along with countless others. So this is uh, primary level research dealing with what they're publishing. Um, I'm not including Elisa's books in these studies. I'm not in, in, in what I'm counting as progressive. I'm not including other apologetics books. Uh, and so over the last four years or so, I've uh, really nailed down uh, progressive Christian content as my dominant uh, focus with research focus within apologetics. Uh, in that time, I've also gone to the Cross Examined Instructors Academy twice. I'm a Colson Fellow and I'm on staff with Grassroots Apologetics for Parents and Women in Apologetics. I am the only man at Women in Apologetics, just to be clear. <laughs> and so I, I, that's I, me. <laughs> I noticed that you you were uh, with Women in Apologetics. I was like, mm-hmm. oh, all right. Um, uh, <laughs> but I I appreciate you mentioning CIA. Uh, for those that are interested in apologetics that are listening, I'm I'm also a CIA grad. Uh, Frank Turk puts it on yearly, and we've had other CIA alumni on the podcast. And I really it helped me polish my presentation mm-hmm. um, back when I was a full time apologist instead of when I went and became a a full time pastor. Uh, it, it's helpful, and you learn a lot. And so we're going to put a link down to Turek's website and Alisa Childers, uh, whom you may have heard of, uh, and maybe you heard her sing years ago and you didn't know, (laughs) but she wrote a book called Another Gospel. That's the one you're referencing, Mm -hmm. right? Yes. So that was the first book she uh, published back then. She also published uh, Live Not... or um, Live Your Truth and Other Lies, and I believe that came out last year either last year or the year before. And then just in the last couple of weeks, uh, her third book came out, which is The Deconstruction of Christianity, uh, co-authored with with Tim Barnett. Uh, And that one also focuses predominantly on progressive Christianity. Yeah, and I've got, I'll have to link Tim Barnett's red pen. um, Yeah. Yeah. Amazing stuff. But uh, I have not got that book yet, but I I need to. So it's on the list. Um, Awesome. (laughs) 
You have gone straight to the source. And we hear this term, progressive Christianity. And if, if you're not hearing it now, you're going to hear it. I heard mm -hmm. it when I came here to California to pastor five years ago. I, it was the first time I heard it inside of a church with someone saying, I, I'm a progressive Christian. And I'm like, where did I get hired at? Um, mm -hmm. But they still were not um, as progressive as as people previously involved in the in the church that I was just finished serving, uh, and so it's it's interesting. I've heard the term used a lot. Some people mean different things by it. Could yeah. you give us a definition and, and some of the commonalities of what they're shooting for when they say I'm a progressive Christian? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the first point of clarification I want to. Uh, bring up or two clarifications because I see this a lot, especially in social media, is one, uh, what I'm not talking about are Christians who are politically progressive. Now, to be clear, there is a lot of overlap, but it is possible, all but I think there's going to be some issues there, but it's possible to be uh, theologically orthodox, to be Christian, and to be politically progressive. That is possible. So that's not what progressive Christianity is, though they overwhelmingly are progressive politically. Uh, the second thing is it is very hard to nail down, but it is still a very distinct thing. And the reason I say that is because I see a lot of people, try. they'll throw Joel Olstein under the bus as progressive Christian. And I'm like, no, that's not progressive Christian. That's a whole different issue. Um, so progressive Christianity itself, the shortest definition I've seen that is, in my opinion, one of the uh, most uh, practical comes from Austin Moult, and it's uh, he contrasts three types of Christians. Fundamentalists hold every doctrine as essential, i.e., if you disagree with any doctrine, you're a heretic. Uh, healthy Christians uh, recognize that there are essential and non-essential doctrines, i.e., there's things that the, that the Bible is not necessarily clear on, and there's other things that it is overwhelmingly clear on, and we need to understand the difference between the two. And then progressive Christianity holds that there is nothing essential. And I'll hit that on uh, in particular because that is the shortest, best definition I've seen. My technical definition for, for progressive Christianity, and some people are going to recognize these terms, but I'll explain it in a bit, is that it's the current Western uh, spiritual zeitgeist wrapped in moralistic therapeutic panentheism that openly rejects the theological authority and accuracy of the Bible while identifying as Christian and followers of Jesus. I know that's a lot of big words. Some people recognize the terms. The simpler version of that is, uh, there's no one way to the divine that is within us. Do good things, pursue what makes you happy, wrap it in the Jesus banner, and then anchor it in uh, current Western political activism. And so the things you'll see with them is uh, Jesus isn't the only way. You don't have to believe in Jesus. You don't have to believe in, you don't even have to believe in God. Uh, you don't have to believe in the resurrection. You don't have to believe there's only one way to heaven. Uh, I have not seen any, to my knowledge so far, uh, progressive Christian leaders that hold the Bible as actually theologically authoritative, i.e. the the Bible accurately presents God and is our highest source for how we know about God. Um, and so when you see uh, LGBTQ support, when you see the Enneagram, when you see deconstruction, when you see, uh, you know, don't put God in a box type of language, when you see, uh, you know, well, the Bible has mistakes about who God is, especially Martianism, the uh, heresy that the Old Testament God is different from the from Jesus or from the New Testament God, when you see God is love and so God wouldn't send people to hell, when you see that type of language, almost always that's going to be a progressive Christian language. It may not be a progressive Christian person because they may just be struggling with one or two areas, but that type of language is going to be progressive Christian language. Uh, and it's almost always going to end up leading in that direction. I'm familiar with moral theory therapeutic deism. Yeah. Um, but you have moral therapeutic panentheism. Could you explain yes. both of those terms for us? Yes. So moralistic therapeutic deism comes from uh, the book Soul Searching by uh, Smith and Denton published in 2009. And it was a uh, kind of a sociological examination of American religion at that time, in particular among uh, the uh, teenage, early 30s age range. 
And so the basic idea is, like I said, you know, do good things, pursue the things that make you happy. There is a God that's out there and he wants you to be happy. Um, so nothing really concrete, nothing really certain, but just, you know, good vibes type of stuff. Uh, the reason I changed it to panentheism is because Richard Rohr is one of the most uh, influential progressive Christians that's out there. Um, and in particular, by example, he's the reason the Enneagram is in the church today. And you can see the Enneagram all over the place. In his book, The Universal Christ, he explicitly teaches panentheism. That's literally his word for it. So by exam or by explanation of why it's problematic, in theism, if you know what a Venn diagram is, you have you know overlapping circles that uh, show similarities and differences. Theism, God and the universe are two different things. In pantheism, God and the universe are the same thing. In panentheism, the universe is within God, but it is part of God. And so, by example, in uh, the in the book, The Universal Christ, Richard Rohr actually explicitly teaches that he uses the word Christ as a code word for the incarnation of the universe. Uh, so he, <laughs> yes, welcome to my life. <laughs> so he actually explicitly teaches that the universe is a actual part of God. Not that God is everywhere, but that everywhere is God. And then God is also more than the universe. And that's very different from Christian Trinitarian monotheism, which is God exists and God created the universe and the universe is not a part of God. Creation is not a part of the creator. But that idea is, I don't find it in every progressive Christian writing that I've read uh, or book that I've read, but it's in a majority of them. And it's in uh, when they talk about the divine, when they talk about the divine within you, looking within yourself, all of that type of language almost always goes back to the basic idea of the universe as part of God, the panentheism. So that's why I changed that. You know, unfortunately, I've heard Richard Rohr's uh, views before. It just, it never ceases to astonish me. Um, <laughs> Oh, don't worry. I've got worse if you want. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I think we're going to get there. Um, <laughs> yeah. I know we, we put out the big language definitions, uh, mm -hmm. but one thing that I have learned practically in ministry over the last year, uh, sometimes painfully, uh, so is, is sometimes we're really good at putting out the textbook definition. We're not so mm -hmm. good at explaining it at a layman, layman's terms, right? Um, and so I'm thinking of some rural churches, even in my area, that have lay pastors um, that don't have the formal education that some of us have. And so how would you describe that to them? Um, how, how would you bring that down to a level that even if I were to like go up to my church members and say, mm -hmm. hey, this is a working definition of progressive Christianity that they would be able to then go, aha, I see it now. I get it now. How would you describe that to them, I guess? Practical definition I'd provide is, um, I'll try to make it clear in future talks, but it's the, there is no one way to the divine that is within us. Do good things, pursue that which makes you happy, uh, wrapped up in a Jesus banner in Jesus language and anchored in, current uh, Western political activism. Uh, so anchored in things like LGBTQ activism in critical theory and cultural Marxism. Um, on a practical level, an easy way to identify that like these are two very different things is the gospel in Christianity is that Christ came to save us and that through believing in him, we can be saved. In progressive Christianity, Mark Sandlin, one of the co-executive directors of the web of the ministry progressivechristianity.org, which is one of the largest progressive Christian ministries I've studied, or defines the gospel explicitly, this is verbatim, love other people no matter what and let your actions show it. Let me ask you this then. What's yeah. the difference between a conservative Christian who preaches, let's say, 1 John 4, right? God is mm -hmm. love, and so we are to love other people, and is intentional in their evangelism and their apologetics in a, a loving manner to not conform to the world, not to uh, lower the standards of scripture, but to meet people where they're at compared to that of a progressive Christian who's taking that to the extreme, right? Because I, I think sometimes yeah. we throw out love, both sides throw out love, but we don't define it very well. Um, mm -hmm. So how, how would you see that differing between a 
healthy Christian. Um, I'm not even going to use conservative or orth- orthodox right now, just because yeah. I know the that there's some that get held up on that as well. But how, how do you define Christian love in a healthy Christian sense compared to that of the progressive Christian? So David Hayward is a uh, progressive Christian leader. He draws the, he's the, he's called the naked pastor. He draws the black and white cartoons. And ironically, he uh, drew a um, cartoon that perfectly illustrates the issue you're wrestling with, which is, it, it's a great question because you're right. We all throw out love and what do we mean by it? So David Hayward drew this comic where he uh, puts words in Jesus' mouth that, uh, Basically, uh, he has Jesus rebuking religious leaders, saying, you use the Bible to interpret love. I use love to interpret the Bible. And so what he's doing is he's starting with love, and then that's it. And that's how progressive Christians will use 1 John of, you know, God is love. They'll start with that, and then, well, if you get that wrong, then you get everything else wrong. With Christians— Orthodox Christians, traditional Christians who hold to the, you know, first century Christianity, we start with who is God. And why do we do that? Because that tells us what God thinks about love and what God's definition of love is. And I'll hit that in a lot more depth in a bit, but that's our fundamental starting point is love itself is vastly misunderstood today. I mean, just by practical example, we have, you know, complementarians who believe that it's loving to have, you know, women are not allowed to be pastors. And then we have progressive Christians who say, if you do that, that's absolutely not love. We've got two different sides that are both saying this is, you know, we're being loving in what we're doing and in what we believe. So that's one reason why I don't like using the word love at all as that foundational, but also these days it tends to be more understood as a feeling. And this is where I get really frustrated with progressive Christians because every adult who's gone grocery shopping while they are feeling hungry knows that starting with feelings is almost never a good idea. Right. (laughs) You said so many good things there. I, I will confess that there is one naked pastor co- comic drawing that he did early on that I saw and I really liked. And it was Jesus standing outside the door of the church and they're pushing against the door. And he's, you know, they're saying, don't let him in. If he comes in, he'll change everything. And I didn't know who the guy was. I shared it in many yep. places. And then as time went on, I saw, oh, wait, <laughs> the Jesus that he's he painting wants someone come- else. Yeah, yes. that's not the same Jesus. <laughs> I that you were thinking. <laughs> yes. Right? That is a very different Jesus. Yes. Uh, and that, and that's, that's why I consider pro- progressive Christianity the greatest uh, threat in the church, <clears throat> because it actually is in the church. So by contrast, you know, we have the Latter-day Saints. They are their own church. They do claim to be Christian. And I mean— Frankly, they have a bigger claim to it than progressive Christianity does, Um, but they actually are their own church. They are trying to get people from the church into their temples. Same thing with Jehovah's Witness. They are trying to convert you into their churches. With progressive Christianity, they're trying to convert our churches into their churches. And they're doing it through things exactly like that, that sound really good, uh, until, and if you're familiar with Mama Bear apologetics, you may be familiar with this term, linguistic theft. Um, they use, and I'll, I'll point to, I believe it's Kindled Faith that uh, said this, uh, they use the same vocabulary, but a different dictionary. That's why it's important to always ask, what do you mean by yes. that? I mean, it's the the Columbo question mm-hmm. from Greg Kokel and his book Tactics, and it's one of the yep. the best books I, I recommend for people like starting mm-hmm. out in discipleship, like you need to get this right off the bat Yes, uh, yeah. to help you recognize errors of all kinds. Yeah, And, and I did want to throw in one little illustration in there. Uh, you mentioned love and I do something mm-hmm. in my household that I, I'm trying to convince other people to do as well. Uh, I tell my kids every night that I agape them because mm-hmm. the world around them defines love in so many different ways that I've yes. taken the time to train them about what the Bible means about love and how I am loving them and, and what agape means. And so I encourage parents to do that and husbands yeah. to do 
to your wives and vice versa. Because I think even the reminder of doing that, like, oh, wait, hold on. I agape this person. That means I have to be self-sacrificial, even when they're throwing a fit because I didn't take them to, you know, get Mm -hmm. McNuggets or whatever, you know, like that kind of thing is helpful. Mm -hmm. And they know it too. I've had my son get grounded and go, all right, son, you know, I still agape you, right? What does that mean? You love me, you know, (laughs) tears, like I'm grounded. I don't get my Nintendo, but that's important. It's not just a feeling. It's not just a happy, good, whatever thing. Uh, and that's what we've made it. And and that's, you're right, that's where the viewpoints diverge. And that's also a lot of times why we see an overlap with progressive politics as well. There's often this starting yeah. point. Do we go and understand this for what the original communicator tried to communicate? Or do we put something on it that it makes us feel as we respond? Mm-hmm. To it? And that's the yep. two different lenses that people are going to use. Well, one can lead you to whatever definition mm-hmm. you want, and one can right. lead you to reality. Yep, one hundred percent. And I feel from personal, from personal pastoral level, a lot of times it comes from a me centric uh, state, mm-hmm. right? You know, um, I've, I've known plenty of people that have went down a progressive path, and oftentimes it's because a family member or a close friend uh, mm-hmm. is struggling. Especially, like I see it a lot with. LGBTQ stuff. I know that that's not the only issue. I'm not harping on that alone. It's one of the but biggest, but yes, that's that's one of the big ones that I've seen. Like if they've they've transitioned into it, a lot of times it's revolving around that door, um, and it's yeah. because of the personal level of that issue, and so they start framing everything uh, to to reflect what they want. I guess is is what I've seen a lot in in, in a pastoral ministry side. And yeah. I, you know, I. To bring in my family again, unfortunately, I, I don't like to do that a lot, but this is just, it's hitting, and I hope the people listening or watching, they're thinking of those family connections of their own, but I have mm-hmm. a brother in a, he's bisexual and has is in a homosexual lifestyle at the moment, and he both knows that I love him, but that I don't mm-hmm. approve of his actions, and we have an open communication line, and I think a lot of people are, it's easier to either cut them all the way out or mm-hmm. to try to embrace them in such a way that you tell them what they're doing is okay. Mm-hmm. You have to walk in tension with truth and love. And it's yes. uncomfortable, but you got to do it. Yes, you have to. Yeah. Speaking of that um, issue of as we encounter progressive Christians, I talk to them. Some of them don't know what they mean by the term. Um, mm-hmm. And, and I, I understand that. So you got to ask the individual but as I talk to many of them, they're convinced they're right and we're wrong. So do they think they're the real thing? And if so, why? It, well, yes and no. And I, I have to caveat that because there is a cognitive dissonance going on with them. Um, and I don't say this cheaply. I don't say this as a, you know, they disagree with me. Legitimately, they don't hold that there is a, you know, one true way. They don't hold that there is a, you know, you actually need to believe these things. And yet they're adamant that we are wrong in just about every way. Tim Whitaker is a great example of this. He runs the New Evangelical uh, podcast. And he regularly talks about conservative Christians. And the way he describes us is we're in the basement. He talks about we're in the basement with our abusive beliefs. But then in his interview with Austin Moult, Austin asked him several times, like, what is it that makes someone a Christian? What is it that, you know, defines Christianity? And Tim couldn't give anything. Tim could give like, well, I believe these, you know, X, Y, and Z things. But he couldn't say that someone who doesn't believe those things isn't a Christian. And to be clear, I'm not talking about like, you know, do you believe in a young earth? I mean, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? And Tim couldn't give a straight answer to that. Uh, when we get into some of these, some of the creeds, and I can send you the link for this. If you go to my website, I have a page for creeds on progressive Christianity. And they their own description of it from progressivechristianity.org um, is that uh, what they mean by progressive Christian is that everyone is welcome, no matter your uh, race, gender, orientation, or faith. You don't have to believe in Jesus to be a progressive Christian. In fact, Mark Sandlin, and this will, for both of you as uh, pastors, or you're going to throw a fit, um, he bragged 
in his book, Progressive Prayers for Progressive People, <clears throat> about taking God out of his own prayers, from his own pulpit, in his own church, during his own sermons, so that he wouldn't offend an atheist member of his church. That's the level of it doesn't matter what you believe that they're dealing with. And so that's why I say legitimately they do think that they have the right way and simultaneously teach that there is no right way uh, or is is no one right way, I should say. Um, and so fact, there's recently, a progressive yeah. Christian listener who's made it this far into this episode. Please, we're, <laughs> we're asking you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, and, the cognitive dissonance there. And those- l- <laughs> let me go on ahead and capitalize on that. Legitimately, if you have a progressive Christian channel, if you're listening to this, you have a progressive Christian channel, and I know progressive Christians complain about like, well, why isn't Elisa Childers talking with us? I'm like, well, she doesn't owe you your time, but... I agree with the sentiment of having more conversation between them. If you're a progressive Christian, you have a channel, invite me on. I'm open. I have like one or two terms that are like, I want to see how you're going to treat me and get a copy of the recording, but that's about it. Otherwise, I want to see more of those conversations, and I would love to be proved wrong about this. But I've read for a numbers thing, um, uh, the average master's program runs through about 20,000 pages throughout the program. I've read about 10,000 I've read over 10,000 pages worth of progressive Christian books plus an equivalent number of pages posts and podcasts or an equivalent amount. I'm not finding serious answers amongst the dozens and dozens of progressive Christian leaders and influencers and authors and professors that I'm reading. So, I want to be proven wrong cuz I would love for it to be a better picture than what I'm seeing, but uh, <laughs> and in person and watching those uh, podcasts as well, I, you know, I see the see the same thing, the the yeah. concreteness there. And and for uh, a lot of folks that are listening here, they have a Christian restoration background, and so we 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 love that quote about you know you know an essentials unity and non essentials mm-hmm. liberty. There's lots of things we can disagree on. Oh yeah, plenty. Ecology, re- fine, whatever. Who the Nephilim were? That's one of my favorite things to talk about. Mm-hmm. But we can totally disagree about that stuff. I mean, that's like <laughs> as an example of mm-hmm. like Star Wars versus Star Trek. I was Trek. just I mean, reading that on. the other day, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So I mean, all those things we can disagree on. Yes, right? absolutely. But who Jesus is, how you're saved, mm-hmm. the Trinity, those are those are essential doctrines. Yeah, Th- those and, are some of the things that fundamentally, you know, say, you know, we talk about what's a Muslim. We have, you know, there it's a much more monolithic picture than Christianity is. But there's still a few key things that are like, this is Islam. And someone who confesses these things and lives according to them is a Muslim. And if someone doesn't, like if someone rejects, rejects Muhammad, I, I want to say there is some segment that does, but I'm like, they don't, rep, they're, they're not a majority. The vast majority of Muslims, they follow Muhammad. Buddhism, they follow Buddha and his teachings. Hinduism, they follow one of a million gods, depending on which variation of Hinduism there's. But there are clear definitions of this. In Christianity, it's those you know, few things that are like, this is what makes up Christianity. Hinduism rejects them. Islam rejects them. And similarly, on those points, Christianity rejects the other religions. And it's in those points that progressive Christians won't hold firm. So, yeah, this is this is not about disagreeing. on. This isn't even onto the level of, you know, disagreeing on Trinitarianism, on, you know, the Trinity versus Arianism. This is, you know, Jesus is God versus Yahweh from the Old Testament is God level of differences. Some of us, uh, when we were in training or when we were younger, we heard terms like emergent. I also heard you say mm-hmm. the evangelical. Actually, I heard that term recently of listening to Sean McDowell. Um, do those things connect to progressive Christianity? Are they different? Any distinction? Just, just to clarify. Okay, so at a, at a short level, um, liberal Christianity, best represented by John Shelby Spong, um, was, I want to say in its heyday, more than 50 years ago, and for, I want to say like 100 years before that, or so, rough, rough very rough timeline. Um, and it was like John Shelby Spong flat out, uh, if I remember the quote correctly, um, denies that Jesus actually had a bodily resurrection. That level of like, yeah. So, 
that existed. The emergent church happened, uh, I want to say it was, it went underground around 20 years ago, but it was in for 10 to 15 years before that. And this is uh, Brian McLaren, I want to say Tony uh, Campolo, and a couple others. So that one went underground. (laughs) It has a lot of similarity to liberal Christianity, but it wasn't quite the same thing. But now the same people have come back up as progressive Christianity and somewhat united with liberal Christianity, especially theologically. And so now we have one mass uh, that, and to be clear, when I say one mass, um, there's one segment, the, um, I think it's called the Holy Post podcast. It's Phil Vischer's uh, ministry. I haven't researched his segment. Almost every other segment of progressive Christianity, either I've researched or I've confirmed that they all generally believe these same things. So there, there's a loose thread throughout history back to the emergent and then kind of connected to liberal, but both of those kind of feed into, and now we have progressive Christianity. Yeah, Phil Fisher, for those that that don't know or recognize the name, one of the creators of VeggieTales. He, he like, likes to walk with potatoes or walks yes. with potatoes. <laughs> Up and down the grocery aisle. Exactly. And, <laughs> I, and I think he'll sing those songs, but yes, he has drifted in that direction. Yeah. I, I don't know if he's as far as some of the other authors, as you mentioned. I'll throw out one piece here that I'm, um, one thread that I'm pulling on them. Uh, so by example, Alistair Begg, most people, most conservative Christians agree he messed up a couple of weeks ago. But for 50 years, he's been faithful. And still, by and large, he is faithful. We believe he gave a bad piece of advice, but the reason I bring it up is, there was no shortage of people calling him out. Absolutely no shortage of people calling him out. I have seen almost no examples of progressive Christians calling out other progressive Christians for saying utterly ridiculous stuff. Um, And I haven't seen Phil Vischer do that either. Now, again, I haven't researched him, so hopefully he does somewhere in there. But um, it it means something when... uh, like, I want to say uh, Tim Whitaker says he personally still believes the, the you know, Apostles and Nicene Creed. But then he won't call out people like Keith Giles, who has no biblical translation experience or education, as far as I can tell, and claims every English translation of the Bible is wrong. Or Caleb Lines, co-executive director of ProgressiveChristianity.com, who says uh, Jesus did not die, for, die to atone for our sins. He died to oppose empire. So it doesn't mean a whole lot if they say, yes, we affirm these things and we don't care that these people are denying everything and we're still going to give them a platform. Well, hopefully this is like the opening for more interaction with you. I would love to have you back, but also I'd love if you're listening uh, or watching for you guys to check out David's website. We'll put a link in our show notes. Uh, That way you can go and check and dig in more. I certainly want to have you back to talk about the Enneagram because that is a hot button issue. That's Oh, yes, very big. (laughs) Yeah, very big. And um, I really thank you for joining us. And I thank you, Chris, for stepping in and helping me out with some extra questions. And we thank you guys for listening or watching. We'd love a like, subscribe, anything like that. DHF is a ministry that is from a collection of churches. And we want to not tell you what to do, but we want to help you do what you do. And that is continue to forward the kingdom of God. And so if you want to learn more about us, including conference, podcast, small groups for pastors, all those things, check out discipleheritage.org.